welcome everyone to the Anti Heritage Museum and the Knox Mine program. Oh, uh, you want to come down so that they can see you? Oh, yeah. They don't know that you're up here, though. Right here near the podium. That's oh, where right the down. microphone is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. Well, they, oh, that way they can see you. <laughs> we are, we're a group of historians, not technologists, so it's, uh, it, took, it took a little while to get to, get to where we are today. Um, you know, we, if you've been here in the past, you know, we used to have just a projector that we would set up there and a laptop, and then we thought we'd make things a lot simpler for us and installing this new system here, which is uh, working out really well, but, um, but it, took, it took a lot of getting here. And I want to thank Tim, who is Sue Han's um, uh, son-in-law, for helping us configure the system. And uh, I think we've got it all set up. There's going to be some ins and outs, some swapping of cables and buttons and things, but I think we've got a really good program today. So thanks again for coming out. Um, I think we're in there like the, the second or third decade of the Knox Mine program. Um, commemorating, of course, the disaster um, in 1959 uh, that took several lives. Um, and, you know, the recent passing of uh, Bill Hasty um, kind of brought a lot of this to, uh, to where we are today. So um, thank you all for coming out again. I know it's been a really difficult, um, difficult couple of years with COVID, and I appreciate you all uh, masking and, uh, and coming out and distancing um, as best we can here. Um, the museum itself, we are in our sort of our winter closure now, but we're going to be open for the rest of the day today. So feel free if you haven't seen Sue's exhibit, um, which is up in the in the changing gallery up to the uh, to the left of the entrance in the exhibit hall, please do so, and we'll be open for the rest of the day. And then the exhibit will be up through the summer at least. So if you've got friends that want to come and see it, um, you can certainly encourage them to do so after that. Um, I'm sure most of you who have been here before know the restrooms are in the back to the right. Um, and if there's any kind of emergency, we've got a, uh, an exit door in the back, of the, uh, the back of the room here. So like I said, thanks again for, uh, for coming out today. Um, I'd say brave and cold, but it wasn't too bad uh, you know, with no wind and everything else. So uh, we've got a really good crowd. And uh, so uh, we've got some, uh, some great speakers tonight, uh, or this afternoon, um, from across the country. We're actually representing three time zones, um, <laughs> Eastern, Central, and Pacific. Um, so with, with one of the positives, I guess, if you want to say of COVID is the fact that we've sort of embraced these new technologies that allow us to reach across, um, you know, across the county, you know, from people outside of Lackawanna County and uh, bringing in more participants. So we've got a really good program. Um, Sue Hand is going to speak first about her artwork and then uh, Teresa Bergman, um, who is a professor out at uh, University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. Um, and I will give her a little bit more of a, an introduction. Uh, but before we bring up Sue, we will let uh, Bob Wolniski say a few words of, uh, of welcome. Say a few words of, uh, of welcome. Say a few words of, uh, of welcome. Well, thank you very much, Bodie. I hope everyone can hear me, and I hope that I'm not in a big echo chamber. But I'm, I'm the guy in the central time zone because I had to cancel my flight plans and other plans to be here. Ordinarily, I would be here with you and uh, in the hall for this, the 63rd, 63rd anniversary of This program we have this year is as good as any program that we've had uh, over all these many years. And uh, you, you've seen the, you, you've seen this, you, the lineup, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing this, although I can't look at Sue's exhibit. Um, I'll have to wait till I come in in the summer. But I wanted to say that this is a key event in Anthracite Mining Heritage Month, which we've been doing over the last 10 years. The 1999 commemoration started Anthracite Heritage Week, which we did for a number of years. And so much response from throughout the region that it eventually, 10 years ago, it, it, it evolved into Anthracite Mining Heritage Month. Uh, this is one of the key events in that month. Um, the program tonight, I'm gonna run through the changes real quick, has been canceled. We had an evening of, of Anthracite region music. We had we had five musicians lined up at the Susquehanna Brewery. We did this two years ago with a great, with, with, with great turnout. And I re well recall dancing the polka with Sue Han that evening. It was just great. It was just great. I'm sure Sue would rather forgive us dancing. <laughs> anyway, 
No, no program tonight at the, at the brewery in Fiston. Um, tomorrow we have the lineup of, of, of the nearest Sunday to the disaster. At, at uh, nine o'clock, there'll be the annual church service at St. John the Baptist in Fiston, 9 a.m. Uh, right after the church service, say, you know, about uh, 1030, we'll be up at the, the state historical marker, uh, which the state put up in 1999, by the way. Uh, in front of Beloga Funeral Home. That'll be an outdoor public, usually about a half an hour, public commemoration. Family members show up for that. I mean, they come from all over the place for that. And right after that, weather permitting, and it may not be, we do the annual walk to the Knox Mine Disaster Site. That's at about 11 a.m. tomorrow. Weather permitting, okay? So um, yeah, and uh, the, the other events that we have uh, planned, there's a, there's a, uh, a meeting uh, tomorrow of those interested in online meetings, traveling to, to the UK, United Kingdom with Bodhi, myself and ben, Beth Landmesser next summer, touring industrial history sites in England, Scotland, and Wales. Tomorrow, we'll have our travel agent there from England to talk about that trip, which we've had to postpone the last two summers. We hope to do it this summer, but um, <laughs> I think it's, it's, a, it's about a 50-50 chance. <laughs> Look, next Tuesday, we have the Luzerne County Historical Society doing a Zoom program on uh, doing anthracite region history. Some available resources. John Fielding will be on that program from the place you are sitting, the Anthracite Museum. <coughs> There'll be David Schaffer, King's Director of King's College, uh, Nicholas Zemieski, are the archivists from the Industrial Archives and Library in Bethlehem, and Mark Persetti, who's the organizer and the speaker. Uh, he, he's from the Luzerne County Society. Um, and the, the other one we have left would be on Sunday, the 30th. The Lackawanna Historical Society has just notified everyone that they're going to Zoom for their live, it's still live, theatrical performance um, called for the least of them. It's on the life of Monsignor John J. Curran of Lackawanna County, originally Curran, the, the so-called mine workers priest. He helped mine workers for, for, for over three decades, settled strikes. He was always in their corner. We just did the, the annual Curran lecture last Thursday at King's College. We did it on Zoom. We had about 70 people tune in on Zoom for that lecture about, about um, the, the, the Ku Klux Klan in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so anyway, Sunday, starting at uh, two o'clock, you go to, uh, go to YouTube, search for the Electric City Television site, and, uh, and click on the, uh, on the live stream button, and you can watch Ken Gordon of Scranton act in this play, sorry, who wrote the play, and, and watch Scott Rave act um, for the least of them, uh, Sunday, two o'clock, coming up, the Electric City Television um, YouTube thing. So with that, I turn it back to Bodhi, and thank again, thank you all for coming and participating in, in a somewhat disappointing Anthracite Heritage Month, but still a lot of really good programs, and we're about to hear one. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Those are the buttons we're, we're trying to figure out. Um, I may have forgotten to introduce myself. I'm Bodie Moore, and I'm the uh, site administrator director here at the Anthracite Heritage Museum. Um, and then I will bring up uh, Sue Han now. Um, and I should also, too, mention uh, Dr. Jennifer Black, who is a historian from Ms. Recorder University, will be speaking um, at the end uh, to sort of tie in the program, uh, you know, our speakers' programs. So let me bring up Sue Hand. Many of you know her, local artist and educator. Um, she doesn't like to be called a historian, but maybe we can call her a um, somebody who tells tales in her artwork. I mean, it's, you know, she's been a very prolific uh, chronicler of the um, of the anthracite region. Um, her her it was the um, the Octagon project from several years ago that was at, that's it's still installed at King's College, um, and her new work. Um, looking at breakers um, in Luzerne, well, in the whole region, 
Um, but, but tonight's, uh, uh, her comments will be just talking about her process and uh, a lot of her artwork. So let's welcome Sue Hand uh, to the floor. I am addicted to cold breakers. And I guess there's worse things to be addicted to, but cold breakers is mine. First, I want to thank the Anthracite Heritage Museum for inviting me to be here today and to exhibit my work. For me, this is better than being at the Met in New York City because I really love coal breakers and anthracite history. And secondly, I want to thank Dr. Robert Walensky, who you just heard, for all of his um, encouragement. From the first time I mentioned that I was going to do this faded memories, he, he has just encouraged me. And I, I, I just want to say thank you, Robert, if you can still hear me, I <coughs> hope so. And I love, you know, like I was the kid in school who loved history, but I can't remember names and I can't remember dates. So I was the kid who would say, oh, well this group of people went down here and then these people came in because of yada, 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 but I couldn't come up with their names and dates. So this is what I have to do. I love how cold breakers look. They're giant castles, they're brown and black. They've got secret staircases and hidden rooms and dangerous heights. They've got enclosed balconies and they're like boxes all stuck together. And I absolutely love to draw and paint them. And I love learning about their histories, which can be very confusing because they burn down, they get rebuilt, they get sold, their names change. And I wanna thank Joe Husky. Wait, Joe, he's my, my resident historian. Um, I drive him crazy sometimes. I'll send a, I'll text him a list. I need histories for the, this, 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 and this breaker. And he's like, yeah, right. When do you want me to get all of these? <laughs> but you might have seen, he had a full page spread last weekend in the Citizen's Voice. So he might look familiar to you if you saw that spread in the Citizen's Voice. I love learning about the people who worked in the breakers and the people who worked in the collieries and the people who lived around them. And so that's why I call it the coal breaker community. I love to paint them. They look like watercolor. If some of you are into artwork, they look like watercolor, but they're acrylic. They're thin layers of glazed acrylic because that's the only way I could get what I wanted to do with the faded memories look and the, the drama and the opaqueness. Some of them have up to 30 layers of paint on them. They're not watercolor because watercolor would smear all over. Much as I love watercolor, it wasn't going to do what I wanted to do for this series. And I want to thank my husband, Joe, who's back there, um, for <laughs> photographing and framing all of them. I've done 123 so far, and I have plans for more. So I want to thank you, Joe. It's, there's, there's been a lot of hard work there. And our daughter, Heather, who has created today's slideshow, <laughs> has been no small feat. And Tim, of course, putting this all together. I hope this is working behind me. I can't see it. Many decades ago, as a high school student, I took art lessons from Dorothy Brace Barber down in Wyoming down in uh, Luzerne County. And one day she took me on a, a trip. We went plein air, plein air painting. And we went to Swearsville, to the back road, to the Harry E. And I think it was that day that I fell in love with coal breakers because back then the Harry E was a clanging, banging, working, loud, kind of intriguing coal breaker. <laughs> And I, I think I could just feel my adrenaline building up. You know, this coal breaker. Well, I, I had no idea why, <coughs> but I really enjoyed it. And after I became a professional artist with a studio in Dallas, I would get together some of my friends, my artist friends, mm -hmm. and we would go not only to the Harry E, but the Sullivan Trail Breaker in West Piston. And we went a lot to the Huber Breaker in Ashley. And we would say, I loved standing at the base of these breakers. And they were like standing at the feet of giants and just thinking of what used to be. It just fascinated me, it really did. And I was fascinated when my dad would tell me stories of how his dad worked at the Mount Lookout breaker in Exeter. 
And my grandpa was not a miner, but he worked on the, around the colliery. And he would fix coal cars, he was a mechanic, he would fix the, the engines, the motors, whatever he had to do. Once in a while, he'd have to go down in the mine and shore up the timbers or fix the gratis work, and he hated it because he could hear the creaks and the groans of the shifting earth. And he was never happier when the job, that job was done and he was back up topside <laughs> because he did not envy the coal miners one bit. So when I painted the Mount Lookout, I painted my, some of my family members into it because my great-grandparents moved from the Red Rock, Jamison City, Elk Grove area to Wyoming, Wyoming Valley, with the lumber industry. They had a, a lumber company and the breakers needed lumber to build them. The mines needed timbers to shore them up. So that's how they moved. Also, my mother's father was a, a breaker carpenter. And so when I painted this one, I painted my mother's father floating around there in the upper right and I painted my great-grandparents down in the foreground, and their son, my dad's father, is kind of right in behind them. And so this kind of art is called surrealism, real things in unreal situations. That's why I got floating people. <laughs> it was my way of telling the story, because the breakers were so big, if I was painting people, they'd be little tiny things and nobody would see them. So I had to do surrealism to tell my tales, as Bodhi said, in the painting. It has become my mission to locate photographic images of as many coal breakers as I can find and paint my tribute to them and the people. I've completed, as I said, 123 to date. I'm working on another dozen right now. And I've located images for approximately 50 more. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> from the northern coal field, from its you know, tip all the way down to, you know, like Four City down to Shikshuni and down into the middle and the southern coal fields. <sighs> There's so many breakers in so little time. <laughs> and Joe Husty, don't you say one word. <laughs> <laughs> what I would like to share with you for the next 30 minutes or less are my newest paintings of coal breakers of Lackawanna County. Actually, there's a few north into Susquehanna County because Forest City just, it's the northern terminus of the northern anthracite coal field, but it's up in Susquehanna County. So, and I wanted to, actually there's four down in Luzerne County, three I just completed, and I just wanna share them with you. And one is key to today's, today. I'll just say that. And of course, Anthracite Heritage, Anthracite History Month. The Erie Breaker in Forest City was, fr and I ha I'm going to read some of this stuff because it's names and dates. <laughs> <laughs> the Erie Breaker in Forest City was first recorded in operation in December of 1881. But by December of the next year, it had a capacity of 400 tons a day. And it was operated by the Hillside Coal and Iron Company. The Clifford Mines Colliery in Forest City saw its first breaker destroyed by fire in 1885. By 1886, a new breaker was built using the most advanced tools and techniques of the age, and the Clifford Mines Colliery was called a model for the entire coal industry in the anthracite region. For those of you not familiar with the terms breaker and colliery, the breaker is a coal production plant, the big, big building, the ones that I'm painting. The colliery is sort of like a campus. It's all the little buildings that supported it. It's where my grandfather fixed the coal cars and fixed the motors and it should be the shifting shanty, which there's a beautiful example of a shifting shanty over in the museum. Don't miss it before you leave today if you haven't seen it already. So the colliery also included the mines underground. So the colliery was everything, the whole caboodle. The coal breaker was the coal production plant where the coal was taken up to the top and then it came down through and it was broken up, coal breaker. It was sorted and washed and gotten ready for market. Came out the bottom, and depending on what time of history it was, it went into a canal boat 
or it went into a train car, or it went into a truck, and it was taken away to be sold. The Coal Brook in Carbondale was owned by the Delaware and Hudson Coal Company, and it was the largest and most prominent facility since it was located right next to the Delaware and Hudson Railroad yard. Carbondale is the oldest city in northeastern Pennsylvania, chartered in March 3rd, 1851. Coal began with the Wurtz Brothers in the early 1800s, and the area was originally called Farrandale. Terence Powderly, and you might remember that name from high school history. He was the founder leader of the Knights of Labor. He was born and raised in Carbondale. The Racket Brook Colliery in Carbondale constructed its breaker in 1856. These are both very early breakers. It produced coal from several mines, prepared coal, sorry, including the Powderly Smoke and the number three shaft in Carbondale. It was rebuilt in 1868, and a mere 21 years later, it was obsolete. The Gibsonburg, later called the German number one, was built in 1860. Gibsonburg was the original name of that settlement, German, in 1874 in honor of John German, entrepreneur and mine operator. It, was, it is located 11 miles north of Scranton. It had a shaft 100 feet deep, was sunk by Ackerman and Company to the 11-foot Carbondale vein. And the breaker was connected to the Delaware and Hudson Gravity Railroad by a spur line a third of a mile long. A year later, shipments had reached over 52,000 tons annually, and the mine was idle from 1863 until 1865. I wasn't able to find out why, but I'm suspecting it had something to do with the Civil War, and maybe the miners went off to battle. Not sure, <coughs> possibility. In 1865, German took over the Gibsonburg Colliery mine and took over an increased output to over 65,000 tons yearly, the most profitable of his many enterprises. However, he failed to ventilate the mine properly, and the problem was not rectified until 1882 when Delaware and Hudson took over. By 1889, the breaker was described as old and dilapidated. It was finally rebuilt to a larger capacity, but it was also that year in 1889 that Dr. Matthew Shields conducted the first training class in coal mining first aid. And that class, 24, 25 miners were in attendance, and it greatly re decreased the serious mining injuries and fatalities. They still happened, but they were decreased. German was previously called Baconville, Rushdale, and then Gibsonburg. Coal mining was, of course, the principal industry. The Gravity Slope in Archibald was a 14-story structure, which opened an Archibald burrow in 1912. At its height, the colliery employed 1,700 men and 120 mules. The mine operated until October of 1955, when mine water began to seep in, and the, it was too much for the pumps to handle. The colliery could no longer continue to operate, and Archibald was named for James Archibald, the superintendent of mines for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, which extended the Gravity Railroad for Carbondale in 1856, causing that wilderness to be totally transformed. Archibald incorporated in 1877, and it was first known as White Oak Run because that's the stream where the mining first took place. Archibald was once the location of a classic mining ghost town. The eastern corner of the village of Archibald after 1880 and the discovery of the Clark vein, a coal mining town named Edgerton developed. Edgerton had a school, it had a store, it had a coal breaker, it had taverns, plural. <laughs> <laughs> and within 25 years, the coal, break, the coal vein in that area ran out, the villagers left, the breaker was dismantled. I'm still trying to find a picture of that. Anybody in here who's a real art anthracite buff has a picture of the Edgerton Breaker. I don't even know if one exists, but I'd love to paint it. The Johnson number two became the German number four in Dixon City. And I always laugh, one is a city, not a city, one is a borough. <laughs> and Tom, the Dixon City was named for Thomas Dixon, who started out as a mule driver in Carbondale and worked his way up to become the fifth president of the Delaware and Hudson Company. Now that's rising above. This colliery was the property of the Scranton Coal Company and then the Elk Hill Coal and Iron Company. 
which takes us to Oliphant, originally named the Queen City, but renamed for George Talbot Oliphant, president of the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. It's located approximately five miles northeast of Scranton on the Lackawanna River. And is it amazing, uh, I was amazed anyway, how many of our towns in Lackawanna and Luzerne County are named for coal owners and operators. The Oliphant Colliery was the area's main employment for mining and shipping coal, but industries also included blasting powder, which they needed in the mines, iron and steel goods, silks, and cigars. Anybody in here ever work in a cigar factory? <laughs> yes, I did, <laughs> in college. It was lousy work, <laughs> right? It was rotten. So glad to be out of the cigar factory. <laughs> After mining, the elephants, you know, like most of the towns, had a severe economic downturn in the 1950s and it depended on the garment industry and a slaughterhouse. I'm not sure which would be worse, a slaughterhouse <laughs> or a slaughterhouse. Uh, the Eddy Creek Breaker was also an elephant. Jones and Company constructed their number two breaker, and in 1881, the new Eddy Creek Breaker commenced construction on that site and was completed in 1882. The colliery was operated by the Delaware and Hudson, and this painting depicts a faithful wife helping to clean up her husband after another drooling, dusty, <laughs> dirty day in the mines. And you can see them down in the, uh, well, right above the eaves, and the wife is leaning over her husband, scrubbing her husband's back, and the husband is bending over a very small wash tub. <laughs> I really prefer a shower, but uh, <laughs> God bless him. This miner did ultimately perish in an accident in a different mine, and I thank the person who loaned me the image of her husband's grandparents. The Gypsy Road in Dunmore. The early spellings of this vary from G-I-P-S-Y to G-I-P-S-E-Y, and these are on the old maps and the old coal mining anthracite records. But by the time it burned down in 1911, it was spelled G-Y-P. I, at the studio, I'll pin my work up while I'm looking at things, and several of my students point out that I spelled it wrong, G-I-P. So I added the other spelling underneath. But it did go by both. This one burned down in 1911, as I said, in April, and Heather found a fantastic uh, article in the Scranton Tribune something or other for that date, you can look it up. Um, a locomotive spark, said the newspaper, had fallen on the tar paper roof that covered the lowest chute of the breaker. And the fire, you know, it was dry, rotted wood, tar paper covering, oil soaked, and the fire rose to the head house, more than 100 feet above where it first started, and it wasn't good. A lot, most of, everybody gave out except for two people, and their bones were found pulverized after the fire was that hot. And so it was kind of like 9-11 in a way for those two miners. But it was like Avondale in that there were buildings on the top of the shaft I've, I've read two reports. One says the breaker was on top of the shaft, and the newspaper said the breaker was on top of the shaft, the mine shaft. And one said, and which is why the miners were having a hard time getting out because of the smoke, and another one said, no, it wasn't over the shaft, so I wasn't there, I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> the Bellevue Scranton began construction of this breaker in 1854, and it was completed in May of 1856. The Bellevue was operated by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. By this time, you've probably noticed, you've seen some faces in a couple different breakers, the breaker boys and the coal miners. I had to go to the Library of Congress for a lot of these photographs because back in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, Grandma didn't have a camera to take a picture of her darling little breaker boy going off to work. so. They don't exist, except for professional photographers mm. like Lewis Hine, who really made it his life's work to photograph these, these kids who were being 
you know, child labor and the whole nine yards. He was commissioned by the government and by other people to photograph very well to do, but he really had a thing for against child labor. So his commissions dried up because he made his children and his minors look so heroic and the more wealthy patrons skipped over him and so he actually died a pauper as poor as some of the people he photographed. The Central Colliery in Scranton began construction work at the shaft in 1858. By 1870, the first shipment of coal left the breaker. This mine produced more coal than any of the company's other mines from 1872 to 1888. At five in the morning on July 24th, 1889, there was an extensive cave-in and eruption of fire damp, which is never good in the mines. It was discovered that pillars had been robbed in a three block neighborhood and large new hoisting engines had been installed to increase output even further. But on August 19th and 20th, 1890, the breaker was destroyed by a disastrous fire, never rebuilt. Coal from this mine shaft was then prepared at the Hampton and Sloan breakers, and the central was owned by the DL and W Railroad. The Green Ridge in Scranton, uh, a report in 1872 read that the old breaker had been torn down and a new addition had been built onto the new breaker erected six years ago, doubling its capacity. At that time, a new plane was built from the mouth of the slope to the breaker. A plane was built to make it easier for, to move the coal from the mine to the breaker because they should be a distance apart. Unfortunately, Avondale and a couple of the others built it right above, but it wasn't a good idea. Uh, also, slope is like this mine tour here. It goes down a slope. That's the entrance to the mine, and it goes down at an incline. If you're talking about a shaft, straight down. You're going to go in a cage of some sort, something, down poof, into the mine. Not that bad. Some of them were. <laughs> if you went down the slope, it was more gentle. And in this one, you ride backwards down in the coal car. And I love it. If you have never gone on the coal tour here, the coal mine tour, do it. It is awesome. I'd love to just sleep down there one night. I think we should have a sleepover. We'll have to ask Bodie for a sleepover. I think we do it. But it's a really, really, really good, where are we, Heather Green? <laughs> anyway, if you're in a tunnel, it's more level, but maybe not exactly level. I mean, it's not Interstate 81. You know, it's not smooth. But those are the openings, the shaft, the slope, the tunnel. From 1902 to 1941, the Green Ridge was owned by Penn Anthracite Mining Company, and it became known as the Johnson Breaker. So some of you may have had relatives who worked at the Johnson Breaker, because this one went until 1941. So anybody, Johnson Breaker relatives? I've heard, I've talked to some people. No? Okay, not here. Next time. The Hampton in Scranton was operated by the DL and W Railroad. And according to shipment records, production began in 1856. This one has more colliery showing down in the bottom. I just was fascinated by some of these little buildings. I like painting little buildings. I like drawing these little structures. I like little boxes, and I like perspective. The Manville in Green Ridge, Scranton, was built in 1884 and was operated by the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. You know, it went from canal to railroad to, you know, like, it just changed names. And the Manville was abandoned in January of 1921, and by that time, owned by the Hudson Coal Company. The Marvine in Scranton was a new breaker constructed in 1920 along the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. From 1890 to 1930, northeastern Pennsylvania was known as the anthracite capital of the world. Totally. Here. The world. The Marvine was heavily dependent on electrical power. The Mount Pleasant breaker in Scranton. Just look at that. Are we at Mount Pleasant? No, that's coming. There we go. It's a castle. Look at it. It's got a tower and arches and balconies. And I know there's secret staircases in there. I just think I like painting the old ones. I think they're more interesting than the, than the more modern ones. But that's, that's because I didn't work in them. The Mount Pleasant shaft was opened by Lewis and Howell in 1854. 
and Lewis and his family lived in a small home located on the northeast corner of Main Avenue and Howell Street. Afterwards, it was used as a private school. Lewis became partners with his brother-in-law, Daniel Howe, and in 1877, William T. Smith secured control of the property from Mr. Howell, and the operation was then owned by the Scranton Coal Company, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard for Joe Hussey to track the history of some of these, because they were sold and they switched names, and it's just like, it, it gets dicey sometimes. The Mount Pleasant had a capacity of 150,000 tons per year and employed 300 men and boys. The veins were called, respectively, the Diamond, the Rock, the Big or G vein, and the Clark vein. The Hyde Park Breaker in Scranton was operated by the Hyde Park Coal Company. In 1857, that was saw the beginning of the sinking of the shaft, another early one. The breaker was already partially constructed, and in 1861, unfortunately, sold its sheriff's sale. In 1862, the DL&W Railroad purchased it for $4,500, and in 1869, the breaker was rebuilt. From 1862 to 1902, it was owned by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad, and the breaker did not operate after 1930. The Oxford Breaker in Scranton began construction in 1861. Operated by the DL&W, regular production from this shaft breaker, shaft, began May 2nd, 1862. On April 15, 1898, a huge breaker fire produced a huge loss. The Oxford burned to the ground, was later rebuilt nine months later. I mean, they didn't fool around. They just, they just did it. By the People's Coal Company, it was located near 10th and Washburn in Scranton, if you're familiar with the, the streets there in town. The Brisbane Bake Breaker, not Baker, the Brisbane Breaker in West Scranton began mine construction in November of 1871. It was named for John Brisbane, a school teacher in upstate New York, who had accepted a position with the DL&W Railroad in 1855. The breaker was located west of the Cayuga Breaker, which I haven't painted yet, and operated until 1919 when it was dismantled. Coal from the Brisbane mine was then sent to the Diamond Breaker, which I haven't painted yet, but I'm gonna do both of those, and operated by the DL&W. The mine shaft total depth was 520 feet down to the Clark Bank, and that's starting to get down there a ways. Takes us to the Von Storch in Scranton. I like this one because of the mule. The mule, right there, <laughs> right in the <laughs> bottom center. I just love those mules, and I read a lot about them, and I, I, I don't know, I really like the mules. In 1872, I should have painted more in them. In 1872, the Von Storch was operated by the Delaware and Hudson <coughs> Canal Company, had a breaker capacity of 1,000 tons per day. It was located in the city of Scranton on the west side of the Lackawanna River. A mine shaft went 350 feet down to the 14-foot vein, <coughs> excuse me, and 550 feet down to the Clark vein. One report stated that the Von Storch employed, are you ready? <laughs> 92 miners, 78 laborers, 42 drivers, 16 door boys, 55 company men, 82 slate pickers, 11 head and plate men, three drivers, 26 company men, eight mechanics, three outside boss bosses, and I, there's got to be a partridge in a pear tree there somewhere. <laughs> they claimed there were no boys inside the mine, less than 12 years of age. And this new breaker was built between 1926 and 27. It was shut down and dismantled in 1948. Edward Hopkins called it the most nearly perfect breaker ever built in the anthracite field. It was the main preparation plant of the Penn Anthracite Colliery Company located in North Scranton on Naog Avenue, off Greenridge Street. It was directly opposite Putnam Street. <coughs> it prepared coal <coughs> from the Kapow's shaft, the Kapow's slope, the Von Storch slope, the Johnson shaft, the Johnson slope, the Ontario tunnel, the Sturgis <laughs> shaft, the Blue Ridge tunnel, <laughs> the Raymond shaft, and the Hackley slope. I did it. All the mines did not have their own breakers. A lot of them had their coal produced at, processed at other mines, other breakers. But all breakers, most of the breakers, had their own mines. 
<coughs> the pain breaker was in Scranton. It was located about three miles west of Scranton. It was constructed by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad Coal Department. A two mile spur from the Lackawanna and Bloomsburg Railroad led to the pine. And construction of the breaker began about 1872 and operations began January of 1874. For its time, it was considered a model breaker. Operations continued with only limited modifications until 1909. It was extensively rebuilt. And the West Ridge Colliery in Scranton. This was one of my absolute favorites to paint because, I don't know, I just enjoyed the colors in this one. I enjoyed, you can see the town behind, the city of Scranton behind it. Um, I painted some interesting people into this one. Um, I just enjoyed doing this. According to a Times Tribune newspaper article from September 6, 1893, the new West Ridge Breaker on North Main Avenue, Providence, was expected to run all departments with electricity. The newspaper declared it should be named the Electric Breaker. It worked the Providence section from North Main Avenue to the outcrop between Putnam and Clearview Streets. In 1912, a report by the Department of Mines of Pennsylvania listed the West Ridge Colliery as good for ventilation, drainage, and conditions as to safety. The depth of the mine was 686 feet. Get it down there. It was mined underneath a school, but those areas, they didn't, were inaccessible because of um, mine gas and, and water. The Moffett Breaker and Taylor, we came through Taylor to get here, I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> this breaker was built by the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Railroad Company in 1914 to 1916. It was described as a, an experiment in revolutionary breaker design and construction. It was built at a time when the DLNW was using concrete for its structures. The Moffett was the first all reinforced concrete structure, concrete breaker, which also contained 500,000 feet of lumber for machinery bedding. Again, why my great-grandparents worked and had the lumber industry. By the 1970s, the breaker was owned by Pagnotti Enterprises, and it was dismantled around 1980. So many of you in this audience might have been familiar with it. I remember seeing the, the, the Moffat and Taylor breaker, they called it, and it was, it was neat. The Taylor Breaker was famous in postcards for its reflecting pool in the foreground. I didn't paint the reflecting pool, I filled it with people. <laughs> I, I needed that much. And I like reflections, but I needed space for my people. <clears throat> Sorry. I, I'm, I'm trying to, can you hear me in the back? Okay. The Morgan in Old Forge was destroyed by fire on August 5th, 1970. It was built around 1940, a latecomer, unused for its last seven years. The town of Old Forge was so named because there was already a forge there when the Scranton Iron Furnace was were built, so it became Old Forge. And now with artistic license, I'm gonna creep south of the border into Luzerne County. The Barnum in Duryea began breaker construction in 1880, but work was not completed until the spring of 1881. The new breaker was 80 feet high and had a production capacity of 1,000 to 1,200 tons per day. In 1892, the breaker burned after a fire originating in the pump house enveloped the shaft tower and then spread along a connecting trestle to the breaker itself. After the fire, coal from that mine was taken to the Bunker Hill breaker in Dunmore until the Barnum was rebuilt in 1893. For those of us in the Wyoming Valley area, Bunker Hill Breaker, I'm immediately thinking of the three breakers in Luzerne, up on Bunker Hill. And it's one of those things in the history of coal mining that makes it confusing. The central breaker in Duryea is an, has an interesting pre-coal history, I thought. The Pittston area was located in the heartland of the three rival Native American nations, the Susquehannock tribe of the Conestogas, the Iroquois Nation, and the Lenape or Delaware tribes. By 1670, and remember 1620, the Mayflower, by 1670, after three years of a plague, 90% of the Susquehannocks had died. Wow. That's worse than COVID. <laughs> Zebulon Morsey settled at the southern end of what would become known as Duryea on the eastern shore of the Susquehanna and Lackawanna rivers. 
which today is part of the greater Pittston area of Luzerne County. Hiram Duryea, the town's namesake, and was a Civil War general, coal operator, of course he was, an officer in the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. The, <coughs> the town was named after the railroad station, and the railroad station was named for Charles Duryea. Incorporated in 1901, Duryea boasted three large collieries, not just one, and a thriving coal mining and silk manufacturing industries. And the breaker, this breaker was later owned by the Pennsylvania Coal Company. The Heidelberg breaker in Avoca was a metal and wood frame structure built by John McDade of Scranton in 1933 on the site of the original building, which dated back to 1867. Now that first original breaker, that's not this one. The first original breaker was officially called the Ontario, but known in the area as Old Hannah's after a nearby resident, Hannah Williams. I really want to know her story. <laughs> I really want to know why. What was she like? Hannah Williams. That breaker was raised in a dynamite explosion in 1929. The McDade Coal Company remained in operation until the Knox Mine disaster of 1959. The breaker was sold for scrap in 1970, but the very next year before it could be torn down was destroyed by fire in 1971. Avoca <coughs> was originally named Pleasant Valley, but on October 10, 1888, an excursion train went to Hazleton, and on the way home, somewhere around Whitehaven, there was a train wreck and an ensuing panic, and 64 people died. 29 of those were residents of Pleasant Valley, and it was decided to change the name of the town in their grief to Avoca, which actually means Valley of Tears in Irish. And last but certainly, <laughs> not the least, <laughs> I get emotional, sorry. I'm gonna try not to. One of my, a couple of my students said they're gonna make faces at me because I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> See them! <laughs> the Ewan Breaker in Port Griffith. The original Ewan Colliery was built in 1886. It was burned down December 11, 1914. That breaker was replaced <coughs> excuse me, by a steel and concrete structure June of 1915. That's six and a half months. I said, they didn't fool around. The Ewan was a massive operation. It was named in honor of John Ewan, president of the Pennsylvania Coal Company from 1851 to 1877. And he was founder and investor of the Gravity Railroad to Port Griffin. Normally, the Pennsylvania Coal Company did not name the breakers, they numbered them. But by 1959, not a single large colliery in Wyoming Valley was working at full capacity. Many of the breakers had been dismantled, including the Ewan. So if you're looking for the Knox breaker, this was it. The Knox did not have their own breaker. This was where the Knox mine disaster happened. And the River Slope mine section was leased to the Knox Coal Company. Well, the, the Ewan Colliery just leased things out, you know, later after the break was gone to smaller companies. And so the River Slope mine was leased to the Knox, which allowed the Knox to work the Pittston vein, which was the big vein in the Port Griffith area. Their new 230 foot slope went through solid sandstone known as the River Slope. The Knox also held lease to the Hoyt shaft, which was located at the old Ewan Colliery, and the old Eagle air shaft, which had been dug 1868 by the long defunct Eagle Coal Company. Around 1130 AM, January 22nd, 1959, exactly 63 years and three hours ago today, the Susquehanna River, swollen from a January thaw and heavy rain, broke through the roof of the Ewan Collieries River Slope section at the Knox Mine <laughs> in Fort Griffith, and the disaster began to unfold. 69 workers escaped, 12 died and were entombed forever. Many more lost their jobs as the network of underground mines in the Wyoming Basin flooded. I want to thank my son-in-law for reading that because I couldn't. <laughs> I tried a bunch of times and I couldn't do it. And I look pretty silly up here, you know, sobbing. So, and I'm still might happen. 
but there have been many, many books written about the Knox Mine disaster. My three favorites were written by two of my friends. One is Brian Glon, and I know he's here. Brian? He wrote about the mining disasters in Wyoming Valley. The last copy was just sold. I was so excited because all three books were out here and I was gonna give a totally unpaid testimonial advertisement, but the last one of Brian's is sold. It's still available, I think, Amazon and other places. So the other two are by Robert Walensky, and Robert is the founder of this uh, fantastic, this whole history month that has been every January. Um, his two books, and they're, they're still out here, I believe, um, and I hope he's still watching. They are <laughs> classics. They are just so authoritative and definitive, and it's anything you want to know about the Knox Mine disaster, you can find in those two books. Tomorrow, some of us will walk to the site of the Knox Mine disaster. We'll walk along the old railroad bed to the breakthrough site. It'll look a little more white than this. <laughs> I took the walk in early December. I'm still going. As someone here said it's very icy. It could be very dangerous. I'm going. So I will be there. If anybody else comes, I'm not going. Go. <laughs> we will stand on the path and look out at the peninsula, which was created when the gaping hole was filled. We'll pause to remember the terrors of that day, exactly 63 years ago, today. We'll think of the surging power of the Susquehanna River, both in the river and underground in the mine. We'll walk further upstream to the site of the old Eagle Shaft. Total of 33 men escaped. Yay, team! Two separate groups, they escaped. They made it. That opening's been blasted, filled in forever. It should have been filled in before, but thanks be to God, it wasn't. Somebody didn't do their job. But it was, it was planned, I swear. We can still stand in awe, picturing what it was. This one is tough for me. Amadeo Pencotti climbed up that hole, 52 feet. Toe hold, it was frozen. Toe hold, finger scraping up it, just think of it, and then getting over the edge at the top without falling the 52 feet back. That's heroism, <coughs> just to get hope, just to get help. And the mine was flooding. That's why I paint breakers. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. I told you I'd get emotional. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks, Tim, and thanks, Tim and Heather, too, for your expertise in uh, your keeping questions. our technology. Yeah. If we want to take a couple of quick questions, Sue will be Any around questions? after the program. Any questions about anything? Not about the dumb person names. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any breakers still uh, standing? standing? No. No, they're all gone. Um, the Huber breaker in Ashley was the last one here. And the, what was the one down Schuylkill? St. Nicholas Breaker, that one's gone. There are no actual real production plants still standing. We tried valiantly to save the Huber and didn't make it. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks Sue, and she'll be around um, uh, after the program today and be sure to go see her paintings that we have on exhibit here. Um, now we're gonna move on, and first of all, let me ask uh, our second, uh, in the back, is it, can you see the screen okay? Would, if we turned off the lights back there, would it be a little easier? Yeah. All good? Okay, great. Well, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Teresa Bergman, who is a professor of communications out at the uh, University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. Her specialization is commemoration, um, and she'll talk a lot about that. And she uh, made a trip up to the Anthracite region this summer, and we're going to figure, I'm pretty sure, in her, uh, in her first chapter in her next book, Looking at commemoration, so let's uh, let's welcome Teresa to the to the stage. Just a minute, Teresa, you're muted. Just a minute. Can folks hear me? Okay. 
this very enduring. Once or twice, as David Fallon found that 79.9% of their respondents found history museums the most trustworthy source for historical information. And this finding was reaffirmed in a 2020 market museum marketing report that found that not only are museums viewed as highly credible sources of information, but they're also trusted entities overall. So given this credibility, particularly during times when there is reduced trust in, dem in democratic institutions, the message is communicated to visitors at sites of public memory, the museums, their exhibits, the architecture and the grounds are increasingly consequential because this trust contributes to visitors' willingness to believe the messages of the depicted events, people, and places. In each of my books, I do not make claims about visitors' responses or understandings of each site, but I do make claims of how the locations position their audiences or visitors through their symbolic elements. I'm particularly interested in the changing social relations at the sites of public memory and how they can create communal belonging and shared identities through their symbolic representations. So several themes have come up in my research that I found encouraging and that move beyond compensatory additions in their depictions of underrepresented groups into the commemorative landscape. So here are the themes that have emerged so far that the site of public memory focuses on the groups of people involved in the commemorative events instead of just focusing on individuals. The geographic location and architecture are key components in the interpretive materials messages. The celebratory approach does not dominate the commemorative messages. The sites employ a variety of forms to communicate their messages, including performance and there is less emphasis on traditional exhibits. And the fifth one is there's consistent outreach. There, there are explicit interpretive messages connecting the past events to the present. And the sixth theme that I found is that, um, the sixth theme that I found is that there's consistent outreach and inclusion of multiple publics in the sites creation and ongoing development. These thematic, these thematic organizational, structural, and political choices provide opportunities to commemorate those not usually commemorated in the US landscape. These approaches to commemoration open the door for the inclusion of those disenfranchised, those restricted from public speaking and public spaces, and recognizes the political work behind the scenes that women, people of color, and the working class have been doing and that continues into the present moment. These recognitions communicate more complex messages about our civic, national, and patriotic contributions, and they also challenge traditional definitions of citizenship, nationalism, and patriotism. Each public memory site that I'm studying has encountered its share of political and financial challenges, and their endurance in these hyper-politicized times is a continual concern. I'm, I see that there's a message in the chat, so I just want to make sure everything's going okay here. Are people seeing my slides? No. Not now. Shake your head. <laughs> no. 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 You're not seeing the slides. No. No. They're not. They're not oh, forwarding. Oh. Okay. They're not advancing. Um, Bodhi. Is there a reason why the slides aren't coming through? Uh, they were there, but were not advancing. You want to try and pull your screen up again? Anybody, Bodhi, are you there? <laughs> Go ahead and. Oh, it's just. I'll go back. Uh, let me know when you go back to screen share. No, it says that I can do it. I'll try again. See if it comes up. Let me. Uh, you can let me know. Yes. 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 Oh, good. Great. All right. Well, sorry about that. Teresa.
Teresa, I think. So, Teresa, um, don't go into slideshow slide mode. Show mode. What's that? I think you were in slideshow mode, slide and that's why we couldn't see them. Okay. So everyone sees the commemorative themes slide? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. Then I'll, I'll just continue. Um, so here are the other, the, uh, so the other five, the, the new five locations that are going to be in my book. And um, one of them, the five sites that I've chosen, they reflect my priorities of highlighting sites that deserve recognition for their achievements and endeavors in recognizing the fruits not traditionally included in the landscape. These sites also represent significant changes to U.S. commemoration because they focus on the stories of women, people of color, the working class, and immigrants whose experiences have long been absent or significantly diminished in America's national commemorative landscape. So, in addition to um, the first chapter is on the Anthracite Heritage Museum, also looking at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Memorial that's in the that's being constructed now in um, New York. The Port Chicago Naval Magazine Memorial in uh, Concord, California. The Women's Rights Pioneer Memorial that's in Central Park. And the Lower East Side Tenement Museum that's in Manhattan. So there's, there's no site of uh, public memory that captures all elements and um, of the events and people commemorated. However, I find that these sites are engaged with depictions that move beyond traditional commemorative practices. Each site has its limitations for a variety of reasons, ranging from funding to public support and now to COVID-19. Nonetheless, these sites contribute to creating a more diverse and inclusive commemorative landscape and the messages communicated at these locations are part of a wider national and international movement of revisiting the goals of commemoration and commemoration's role in social justice and representation of history. All the five sites that I've chosen for this book exemplify significant changes to the U.S. commemorative landscape because, because they're adding stories of women, stories of people of color and the working class who experiences have been long absent from um, America's national commemorative landscape. And this is how I got to <laughs> the um, Anthracite Museum Complex and the Lackawanna Coal Mine Shore. As, as you know, okay, a substantial commemoration of Anthracite coal mining in northeastern Pennsylvania. Dr. Marin pointed out that there are over 100 memorials to miners and anthracite coal mining in this region. And each is supported by distinct organizations. The internet has sort of uh, stepped out on us. Um, do you want to make a few comments? Yeah, I, mean, I have her talk. and Scranton Iron Furnaces also opened in 1977. The Lackawanna Coal Mine Tour opened for public tourism and rides into the coal mines in 1986. 
So each of these sites offers visitors insights into the many aspects of anthracite coal mining with an emphasis on authenticity. This is an interesting emphasis on authenticity in Eckley Miners Village, which contains mostly original homes that, that house miners and their families. And this Eckley, the Eckley Patch Town was created in 1857 and stopped being a company town in the 1930s. Mining continued until the 1980s, and legacy families lived there until about 2000, the year 2000. In 1968, the filmmakers of the Molly McGuire film paid to rebuild parts of the town for their home. This influx of private money served to accurately recreate the town, and the, then the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission took over maintenance of the site after the film. So the messages communicated at the Anthracite Heritage Museum complex and the coal mine tour, um, they're complex and they're historical and they're Kirk. The Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission administrators have encountered multiple challenges in their interpretations of these sites, ranging from embracing the area's profound respect for miners and coal mining technology, to depicting child labor and safety issues, to the environmental effects of coal mining and its use, while also capturing the deep community relationships to this particular geographic area. I had read several academic histories about the commemoration of anthracite coal mining in northeastern Pennsylvania, and that, combined with my visits to the area, made it clear to me why there's so much support for commemoration of mining and miners, their families. Museum, Heritage Museum focuses on the groups of people involved in the commemorated events instead of focusing on individual historical, <coughs> focusing on historical individuals, which allows them to connect to the current community. There, within the museum, where you're at right now, there's about 2,000 square feet um, dedicated to the garment industry, and it illustrates the importance of this industry and helps visitors understand the role that the garment industry played for mining families in terms of supplanting mining income and the work of women and their, and their daughters. There's also the church exhibit. This is, there's, and there's, within the museum, there's multiple exhibits of the ongoing waves of immigration and their accompanying cultural impact. The second thing that I was looking at, the second theme of the museum, is that it's located in anthracite coal country, and the museum clearly delineates the, lo the location of the mines, explains the and the geography of anthracite coal. The celebratory approach to commemoration is found throughout the exhibit, but it's communicated in terms of the patriotic work that um, during the World Wars and in terms of technological progress. The Anthracite Heritage Museum represents not just the men, but also the women and children that contributed to the war effort through their work here. And these messages are accompanied with recognition of the dangers of coal mining. The fourth theme of using multiple forms to communicate Anthracite heritage is found in the combination of just the museum, the Scranton furnaces, um, walking through the Eckley Patch Town, and the Lackawanna coal mine. Visitors can ride into a former mine, walk through Eckley, explore the furnaces, and this combination of experiences works really well to communicate the many aspects of mining history and these types of activities associated with historical tourism have been shown to stick with visitors in their understandings and memories of their visit to various sites. The fifth theme of connecting the past to the present is communicated throughout the museum. It's communicated through, we see exhibits of uh, the current immigrants to the region and tracing their enduring legacies of previous immigrants. And the final theme concerning outreach is clearly seen throughout the sites in the Was There a Minor in Your Family campaign. So the goal of my book and my talk today is to highlight those 
public memory sites that are deeply engaged with representing those who have not been part of the traditional commemorative landscape. Even though the toppling and removal of commemorative statues has put this issue in recent headlines, the adding of women, people of color, and the working class to public memory sites has been a much longer project. My goal in this book is to challenge traditional forms of commemoration that focus on an individual. The prioritization of the, of the individual for commemoration has left out women, people of color, and the working class, and to not recognize their enormous civic, regional, and national contributions. These were people who were part of movements, who had been disenfranchised, and subject to enormous physical, cultural, and economic hardships. If we as a country can look to the groups and movements that gave rise to social, political, and cultural change, then we will have a commemorative landscape that provides inclusivity and representation of those groups' work and the outstanding individuals that participated in these movements. This approach provides visitors with representations of public memory that are more explicit, <coughs> inclusive, and contextual. The burden of representation would not be reduced to an individual, but instead run to include the communities and organizations whose ongoing work is also part of the commemorative events. Thank you. Does anyone have a couple of quick questions for um, Dr. Bergman before we bring up uh, Jen Black? Okay, well, since I've already <laughs> introduced Jen, we'll have her come back up. Or I'll have her come up. It's weird being here and there at the same time. <laughs> um, so I, I want to thank Bodie and John for organizing such a wonderful event and Bob. Um, who I'm sorry I didn't get to see in person, Bob. Um, oh, take off the mask. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm used to teaching, lecturing to students and with the mask on, so I've uh, forgotten that I could take it off up here. Probably better to see my face. Um, so thanks to Bodie and John for organizing such a wonderful event and to Bob for his dedicated work in organizing Mining History Month events every year. I was delighted to be invited to speak today, not only because of my own interest in the local history of the region, but because the two speakers, Teresa Bergman and Sue Hand, bring together two of my own passions, public history and visual culture. Um, so let's bring Sue. Yeah, I, I was hoping to have one of the breakers up, so. I'm Thank trying. You, Heather. No, I'm no, 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 take, take your time. I'm gonna talk about the first series first. Sue began her exploration of anthracite heritage over 20 years ago with a series of hexagonal outwork, artworks, and I brought the book that Sue so generously gave me. There it is for the folks at home. Um, hexagonal artworks that, sh as she says, represent the honeycombed disbursement of the mines in the Wyoming Valley. In researching her work, she interviewed families, survivors, and experts. She read books and stories, she looked at photographs and archival documents, and she contemplated the importance of anthracite for the region, for its history, and its people. That first series of artworks, again, oops, the book, um, Anthracite Miners and Their Hollowed Ground, was exhibited in 2005 and 2007. Each piece is, in my opinion, a gut-wrenching collage that blends together history and memory. Snippets of texts intermingle with photographs and sketches framed in black, reds, and blues. The emotional journey encapsulated in that er earlier series, which I should note was 300 artworks, provides a foundation for the exploration that we see today in Sue Han's newer series, Coal Breaker Communities, Faded Memories, which is on display in the exhibit hall. And I would dare say she's on her way to 300 again. <laughs> this new series offers both a documentary and impressionistic guide to the history of this region. Painted in muted earth tones and dampened blues and yellows, the structured landscapes give off an almost otherworldly 
or ethereal sensibility. In nearly each composition, a crumbling breaker emerges intrusively through the center of the space. Like the mountains that encircle this valley, Pan's breakers, Sue Han's breakers, cast a long shadow over the communities that thrive below. In each piece, she includes a cloud of faces surrounding the breaker, offering a sense of the diverse range of ages, occupations, and identities that have been affected by the mines themselves. Drawing on photographs of actual mining families and private and public collections, Sue offers these faces as a tribute to the people of the anthracite region, the miners, their families, and the communities that have long remembered them. Some of the faces are finished, but some are left incomplete, fading into the surrounding atmosphere. Still other faces crowd, they, they're fitted into this space in a sort of crowded fashion, as if to overwhelm the composition itself. This technique allows the figures to drift and emerge like memories that permeate the landscape. It's almost as if we can hear their voices echoing throughout the valleys of the anthracite region and through the hollow breakers that once marked the triumph of the coal industry here. And yet, as much as we would privilege the voices and faces that populate this region, we can't escape the presence of the breakers in her paintings. The menacing structures cut through the clouds of people, dividing the depicted communities that float around them. There is a kind of violence in this action. While the faces tend to smile and invite us in, the breakers serve as a visual reminder of the challenges, the hardships, and the pain that punctuated these communities with every mining accident. As in these paintings, the breakers themselves provide a constant physical reminder of the lives lived, the lives lost, according to anthracite. Interestingly, Teresa Bergman also began her journey into public memory around the year 2000. She has spent the past two decades researching public memory, historic sites and monuments. Her work on the politics of representing the past has been a major force in shaping conversations in the field of public history. And this new book project promises to offer some really important directives for historic sites that wish to grow and change with the communities they serve. As she points out, there's been a lot of contention over representation in public monuments in the past five to 10 years and efforts to reshape, reshape or reframe commemorative historical sites have expanded our focus to include women, people of color, immigrants, the working class, and other traditionally underrepresented groups. Museums want to be responsive to the changing communities around them, she asserts, and she finds that the Anthracite Museum and the Heritage Complex does this exceptionally well. As a monument to the workers that toiled in the mines in the last century, the museum balances celebration of the past with a gaze toward the future. It embraces the diversity of perspectives that have enriched the history of this region. But the museum's focus is not just on the men who worked underground. It's on the miners' families, their home life, on the young women who worked in the garment industry, and on the challenges of immigrant life in the early 20th century. But, as Dr. Bergman asserts, the museum has also interpreted its charge to include the more recent waves of immigration that have shaped the region. This charge is embodied in the museum's mission to collect, interpret, and present the evolution of the region's culture. As Bodhi has often noted, and forgive me if I misquote you, it's not just about mining history, but the history of anthracite. That story, that history, is ongoing because anthracite continues to shape life here today. The anthracite region has, in many ways, precipitated the development of what we might call an anthracite culture, a shared sense of belonging and identity among its community members who maintain an exceptionally dedicated and widespread effort to preserve their local histories. Like Dr. Bergman, when I first arrived in Northeastern Pennsylvania, 
I was also struck by this region's deep investment in its own history. There's something special that keeps families here for generations. It pulls people back after years away, and it pushes a multitude of local history organizations to organize, emerge, and flourish. Just look at the impressive and diverse slate of organizations that Bob Walensky brings together every single January for Mining History Month. As Teresa Bergman noted, coal mining is clearly part of the region's past and the region's present. Anthracite culture can certainly be traced back to the breakers and the immigrants who labored underground, but that culture has shifted and evolved over time in a multitude of ways. Those previously unheard stories also deserve to be told. And as Dr. Bergman asserts, this museum's efforts to engage the changing social and cultural landscape around us has helped forge a bridge between past and present. This kind of work expands the history of anthracite and moves it forward, demonstrating its continued relevance for today through our local communities. So my task today was to bring these two speakers together. And to do that, I think, is to really recognize the ways in which they're both interested in tapping into the wellspring of appreciation for history that characterizes life in the anthracite region. Both Sue and Teresa are trying to quantify and capture anthracite culture in different but related ways. Placing the Anthracite Museum alongside other commemorative sites in the United States Teresa Bergman traces a path for museums that strays from the typical single moment in time approach. This new approach would challenge the notion that history is best encapsulated by static monuments in favor of a more dynamic approach that connects the past to the present. In many ways, Sue's paintings are also monuments to the region and its history. But like the Anthracite Museum, they're living interpretations that work to combine past and present and blur the lines between documentation and memory. Together, the paintings and the museum offer a more complete picture of this region and especially of anthracite history, anthracite people, and anthracite culture. Thank you. Jen, um, really appreciate your comments and thoughts um, and uh, long-standing <laughs> partnership uh, with Mrs. Party. Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Raise your thing up. Right, well, thank you all for coming out today. We have some refreshments in the back, courtesy of the Anthracite Heritage Museum and Iron Furnace Associates. Um, and if you had a good time today, um, we have membership applications in the back to join the, uh, the associate group and help us continue these, uh, these types of programs um, in the past. Check the website for, um, oh, and I want to thank Mike and Linda. Um, there's a, Mike, did you want to say something? Mike, if you come over and look at the modern memorabilia, and that plush is going to be in the show, and just for everybody to look at. I'll be proud. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Great, so the museum will be open until 5, um, and then we're going to shut down until March 4th and reopen again for the spring. Um, and then, like I said, the Suhan exhibit will be open uh, through the summer. So thanks again, everyone. I hope to see you soon. Oh, and then thank, let's thank Tim again for running the control. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there someday. All right, how do I shut it off? Okay, you want to disconnect? You'll go to the meeting. Go down here, leave meeting. Okay. Yeah.